everyone, what's up? Goldie here. And I'm going to be going over the big 13-game main slate that we have here on uh, Friday, June 9th. Um, don't really have, with 13 games, don't really have enough time to wallow in my sorrows about Strider getting blown apart last night. Um, nevertheless, uh, we got a ton of arms today that I think we can get to, uh, some of which very expensive once again. We've got uh, a bit of a different dynamic, of course. Um, you know, so many more arms that we can play, Cole, Javier, Otani, Castillo, and on down the list. Um, the projection deltas, however, and commensurately the, the ownership numbers as well, are not uh, nearly as, um, nearly as spread out as they were yesterday, right? So that means, I mean, the, the same sort of, um, game theory dynamic we we can apply but we can kind of go the other way here today and since all of these guys up here at the top are mostly projecting in the same range on Xavier um you know we can mix and match we can really go any way that we want to you know none of these three guys is projecting so outwardly to the other two um or if you want to include Tyler Wells down here too. Yeah, there's a price difference, whatever. Just of these top three guys projecting the highest, Cole, Otani, Castillo, you know, none of them are, are really all that different here necessarily. Yeah, we've got a, what, $1,200 price difference between Castillo and, and Garrett Cole. That, that matters, of course, right? But, um, you know, in terms of the raw projection and the ownership figures, not so much. So um, that usually means that we can just kind of spread out between them. You could take stands if you'd like. Generally, if you're building a lot of teams, you sort of have to take stands a little bit um, and and choose. Can't get exposure to everybody that we want to play. Um, yeah, we just kind of have uh, lineup restrictions. So that said, I think that's uh, probably where we're going to want to focus. Get you know one of these guys. If you could squeeze in two of them with a very cheap off, or a couple cheap offenses probably. Um, then sure, I think that's a, a playable construction because they're in fine spots and they're obviously very good arms. Uh, but the chalk or typical sort of build is likely to be mixing in one of these guys with somebody down here in the mid-range, right? Staying off of most everybody down here in the cheap range. Today, don't think, despite being a very large slate with 13 games, don't think we're going to be able to get to too much value, you know, under the 7K area or so. So that said, uh, we do have projections and ownership loaded to the site uh, for premium subs. So let's uh, just get into the games and start with Boston and the Yankees. Garrett Whitlock. I like this price tag for Whitlock um, here at 6,500. <sighs> this is a tough matchup for him, though. Um, he's having trouble really throwing, um, you know, throwing it past people deeper in the count, right? He mainlines a two-seamer and a changeup. And he's really only got the three pitches. Well, unfortunately for him, the Yankees are really actually going to have like four or five lefties in the lineup uh, with Judge being out. So they are they may even lead off like a stone minimum Willie Calhoun. Anthony Rizzo, 4,400. Really like this price tag for him in this particular matchup tonight. Jake Bauer still cheap. Billy McKinney hit a bomb last night. Um, so they're, they're just... They're going to be a little bit more balanced than they generally are, being so right-handed heavy, the Yankees. And obviously, we, we talk about this every day. Every day, The two-seamer is a bad pitch, generally, against opposite-handed hitters, unless you can keep it really way down in the strike zone and bury it very hard. And Whitlock just can't quite do that. Uh, it doesn't have enough movement on it, and it doesn't stay down enough. So naturally, two left-handed hitters this is a short sample, yeah, uh, but he's getting picked apart pretty good. Not so much in average, but really kind of on the barrel here. Good bit of hard contact, north of 31% uh, to the lefties. 271 ISO. It's a pretty big number. Where we're mostly concerned, however, is with the raw whiff stuff. Just a 28% CSW. That's a fine number. And he throws a hell of a lot of strike one, 77% percent is very good he doesn't walk people and he mostly stays off of the barrel um it's just pitching to a little bit too much contact with this pitch combination the sinker 
itself and the changeup following, right? If the sinker is break even or bad, once again, the changeup is going to be break even at best and very likely to be bad. And sure enough, he's given up three outs to the field on his changeup. He's throwing this 25% of the time. He'll throw this to same handed hitters as well. That's why he also sees some elevated power numbers there and some average. So um, I think it's a pretty dangerous spot here for, for Whitlock here tonight. Um, getting to some right-handers here, I think is very much playable also. Uh, and uh, Gleyber Torres, 5,200, also hit a bomb last night. Stanton's fine, 48. Josh Donaldson, if he can make contact, he's still 3,400. That's a fine play as well. So you can mix in pretty much everybody here. Um, Josie Trevino behind the plate at 2,800, or Higgs, whoever they go with. That's a, a fine catcher play. And Anthony Volpe, um, no matter where they stick him in the lineup, he's at 3,800. It's all right here as well because Whitlock's really not going to throw it past a lot of these right-handers. So um, I think getting to the Yankees is kind of a, a middling and um, pretty off-the-board stack compared to the, you know, the really the top three teams that we'll go over. Um, I think they can serve to be pretty valuable tonight going after some Whitlock. I, I don't think I'm going to be able to get to any of the 6,500 here. Um, I do like the price tag, admittedly, and I think the projection is okay. I'm worried about upside, and I'm really worried about floor here. He just doesn't have the raw whiff stuff. And if he gives up a couple runs, which I think is very likely, with such a high line drive rate against the right side, hard contact, power numbers, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, at Yankee Stadium, um, I think it's going to be pretty hard for him to make that up. So probably going to be staying off of a lot of Whitlock here today. This evening and getting to some Yankees, if I can make it happen. Garrett Cole on the mound for them, eleven thousand. Um, it's just a price tag thing that we got to manage, and really kind of picking and choosing. Now, I have done a little bit of a deep dive in Garrett Cole, and his numbers are well. The, let's start with the the raw strikeout stuff. That's down, of course. He's only at twenty six percent this season. That's down from the thirty plus percent that we've seen from Cole in the past. He's still throwing a lot of strikes. Walk rate starting to tick up a little, a little bit more for Cole, and you know this is a fine barrel rate at eight and a half percent. He's always had a little bit of a homer problem. This season he's gotten it far more under control, but the he's sacrificing a little bit of the strikeout stuff um, than you know compared to years past. So not that 26 percent in aggregate is a bad figure or anything, but this isn't. Garrett Cole, who's just so far and away the best strikeout pitcher on the slate anymore. Um, you now, he's still throwing a lot of strikes, and it allows him to work to his secondary offerings and dictate when he would like to throw them. And that's a good thing because as of right now, the breaking stuff, slider and the curveball, are neutral value for him. And really not providing him a hell of a lot of swing and miss. He's getting swing and miss on the changeup. He's only throwing this pitch 10% of the time. Throw it more to lefties, of course, but uh, not a lot there. Cutter's just kind of a show me, a little bit of a uh, you know slider-cutter mixture here in the data. Still mainlining the four-seamer, and since he's throwing so many strikes, he's getting ahead in the counts, and he, he can dictate when he can... Um, when he wants to throw this slider and this curveball, and that allows him to eke a little bit more value out of it. If he had to throw these pitches in sort of suboptimal counts, if he were not spotting this four-seamer as well as he is, you would see far more negative value on these two pitches. So I think there's some, um, there's some underlying concern here for Garrett Cole. He's, going, he's only got a 28% CSW here, and this is not an elite figure for an elite starting pitcher or a guy that has been elite in the past, right? Just an 11, sub 11% swinging striker. He's still getting a lot of called strikes. But there's a little bit of uh, shenanigans going on here with Garrett Cole. So at 11,000, I don't think this is a, a smash play. And the market is kind of agreeing here. Um, sure, there's plenty of other guys that we can play. The other two that we talked about briefly in the open, that's fine. But he's got an 81% strand rate, and over very large samples, this number is not sustainable. There are two arms in the last 40 years that have been able, over very large samples, similar to a sample of Garrett Cole, 
that have been able to sustain anything close to this number, and it's still not this high. So it, it, those two arms are Jacob deGrom and Clayton Kershaw, and they both have strand rates, career strand rates, of 79%, right? So this is a little bit high. We are seeing a about a run delta or so in the realized suppression metrics here in the ERA versus the expected a run higher. So if we're expecting a little bit of regression here with a depressed strikeout rate to his career averages, these are down two and three ticks. Um, barrel rate creeping up, walk rate creeping up, strand rate still hovering at an unsustainable number. I think you can get off of a little bit of this. I don't think this is a, a necessary play, certainly on a 13-game slate when we've got plenty of other arms that you can get to that are not 11,000. Sure, yeah, the value and, and the projection uh, are all attractive, as is the ownership for Garrett Cole. We know he has you know 45-point upside, um, but it's not all that regular anymore. It's not as much of a smash play as it has been in previous seasons. So uh, I like... I like Cole, don't get me wrong. I, I'm not certainly not going to X him out of the pools. I'm not going to go out of my way to stack against him with the Red Sox, even though this is a very dangerous team in a small ballpark, too. Um, if you want to play a Rafi Devers, Masataki Yoshida, I think this is fine. They get Adam Duvall back, it looks like, tonight. He's 4,900. I don't want to do that. Um, don't particularly want to play Verdugo or anything like that at 47. But I think a a leverage piece off of some of this Garrett Cole one-offs here or there is that they're playable. Uh, I don't think you have to smash in at 11,000 Garrett Cole. You can, you can absolutely. Don't get me wrong. Cause he still has 26% K rate. It's, you know, well above average for everybody on today's slate, but these are mostly just average numbers for a starting pitcher. They're not elite anymore for Garrett Cole. So uh, 11,000 is not, you know, it's not easy to make happen on a full 13 game slate. Uh, okay, let's move on. Mets and Pittsburgh. Um, Mets really got after Strider last night. He was not good. And I sort of neglected to mention yesterday that, um, you know, he still only got two pitches. And any lineup in baseball, if you've if you've only got two pitches to worry about, uh, it makes it a hell of a lot easier for you in the batter's box. And if that elite arm with a 40% K rate just doesn't have his A-plus stuff like Strider last night you can take it, take him apart. Um, and the Mets certainly did that last night. Can they get to a Rich Hill and do the same? Well, yeah. I mean, Rich Hill has got half of the strikeout rate and half the chase that Spencer Strider does. Um, but, for example, in, in a direct comparison, what we've been talking about, he's got a 28.2% CSW. It's actually higher than Garrett Cole, and it's higher than, you know, Whitlock as well. So, um, if, if we're... Playing pitchers from that metric alone, yeah, Rich Hill is more playable, and he's 3,500 cheaper than Garrett Cole. So sure, um, you know that said, no, I don't particularly want to play Rich Hill. He kind of elevates his pitch count a little bit. Still, uh, he's having trouble throwing strike one, and that forces him deeper into counts. Um, but he's still going five and a third here. He's been very serviceable this season, as a matter of fact. In tournament stuff, deep tournament stuff, I don't think this is the craziest play, to be quite honest. Um, now, I know that the Mets just, you know, they're seeing the baseball a little bit, and they took apart the best strikeout arm in baseball last night, got to him really good. But that said, overall, this offense is still very underwhelming and neutral, right? They are average against lefties and against righties. 101 WRC+, 161 ISO with a 28% hard contact and buck 30 ground ball to fly ball. 20% strikeout rate, so they're going to make a lot of contact still, but they're going to be very likely without Pete Alonso tonight, um, who is certainly keeping those ISO numbers afloat. So they're very likely to lose a lot of that right-handed power. They're going to have, like, Tommy Pham hitting in the three-hole, Mark Kana in the, in the five-hole kind of guy. These are not power hitters anymore. Sure, they got the, a Frankie Alvarez uh, or even a little bit of a Starling Marte from the right side of the plate, and Frankie Lindor, definitely. But, they're, they're I mean, those guys are not, uh, in terms of raw power and home run hitters, not Pete Alonso, right? So, um 
do I want to play some of the Mets tonight? I don't think so. I mean, they're kind of middling. Rich Hill is definitely attackable. You can go after him with right-handers for sure still. I don't really want to deal with any of the lefties. He's always been very good against the left side. Um, everything in the arsenal is mostly just break even. He's throwing a lot of junk here. Cutter is really not good because the slider is not very good. But his curveball is still very serviceable, and he's, he's sort of mainlining this pitch along with the four-seamer. So um, he's surviving in deep tournament stuff. I don't think this is crazy. I think he has five innings and seven Ks in him in this particular matchup, but I don't think it's all that much higher. So uh, I wouldn't be too excited at this particular price tag playing Rich Hill against the Mets. But I'm also not super excited about playing the Mets. They're cheap enough. And if you want to play Frankie Alvarez in the two-hole, uh, yeah, go ahead. This is a big ballpark, though. And in in Pittsburgh, it's going to suppress a bit of right-handed power. So uh, overall, kind of lukewarm on the Mets. Probably land on some because of the prices. I do like 4,600 Frankie Lindor, of course. And uh, Alvarez behind the plate, of course, at, at 35 as well. I think they're fine. Um, maybe a, a cheap Tommy Pham. That's fine, too. Charlie Marte still has plenty of speed, still moving on the base paths. That's fine as well. But uh, not my favorite stack. I think uh, I would probably prefer some other middling stacks um, here tonight. Tyler McGill's going for the Mets. We kind of went backwards here a little bit. But McGill's on the mound for them. 6,700. Also really not all that thrilled about playing him tonight. Um, I'm worried about floor and I'm worried about upside, right? He's only got an 18% aggregate K rate. And he's got a 12% walk rate. So, I mean, those two figures right there are going to keep me off almost exclusively. Looking for about a, a half a run of regression or so in um, in the suppression metrics. Four and a half ERA with expected, you know, the, a run, run and a half higher, whatever. Um, buck 62 whip. That's because the whip is so, or because the walk rate is so high. 55% strike one, leaving a lot on the table there. He's just got very little chase in him at just 22%. No value on the a 53% usage four seamer, and the breaking arsenal leaving it on the table quite a bit as well. The changeup has been serviceable for him, so that's suppressing, helping him suppress a little bit of power to the left side. Uh, but with a bad breaking arsenal, there's just no whiffs to same-handed hitters. So uh, I think this is a dangerous matchup for Tyler McGill, to be quite honest. And I think Pittsburgh is a very valuable stack. They're pocketing really hard in, in value so far, mostly because they're cheap. But it's not like these guys are bad hitters necessarily. The only two you have to pay for, really, are Brian Reynolds, 5,300. That's fine. And Andrew McCutcheon at 4,600. Also fine. Um Sneaky high run totals here in this game tonight, and it's going to be kind of off the board. So I think both sides are definitely playable, as Rich Hill is attackable. Um, but I think I'd prefer getting to some Pirates here rather than the Mets playing a Tuki Marcano at the top of the lineup. He's another very good value play at 2400 at shortstop. I think that's fine. Jackson Winsky, I'm going to play him again. At 3400 every time he gets a right-hander, I uh, really like playing Sawinski. Um and you can mix in some guys down at the bottom of the lineup. The cheap pieces, g Bay, plenty of speed, Josh Palacios. Got a little bit of pop and speed as well. So uh, I like getting to some pirate stacks here if we can make it happen. And really not leaving off Brian Reynolds or, or McCutcheon or anything, um, of course. So I think you, get to, you can get to some sneaky offense here. Maybe even a Rich Hill piece or two in some correlated teams. I don't think this is completely out of the question. Um do certainly worry about upside, which is five and a third per start, but I think he's in play. Okay, Dodgers and Philly. I think this game is in play, too. Uh, unfortunately, the offenses here are super, super expensive, so this is going to be very hard to get to. Um, however, given even given their, their pricing, both of these teams popping pretty hard in, in the value metrics so far. Um, Dodgers more so than, than the Phillies over here just because Dodgers are naturally a far better offense uh, but both of these arms are very much attackable Michael Grove 5100 I love this price tag but I hate this matchup and I think this is a super dangerous spot to be going after uh, Schwarber who seems to be heating up a little bit Harper and you know Nick Castellanos hits righties better than he does lefties as a matter of fact JTR I don't really want to go after him Brandon Marsh Maybe heating it up a little bit. Same thing with Cody Clemens at first base. And I didn't even mention Trey Turner and Bryson Stott, right? So they've got a full 
eight or even nine guys here. Drew Ellis hit two bombs a couple of days ago um, that have plenty of power and can capitalize on the hard contact that Michael Grove's given up so far in his five starts. He's about a neutral ground ball to fly ball guy in aggregate, and he's having some trouble getting ahead in counts. Only a two-pitch guy here. He doesn't have a changeup. He's only got the four-seamer and the slider. So he doesn't really have a choice. He's got to throw this to both sides of the plate, and he's going to see a lot of lefties. He's going to see a balanced number of righties with Trey Turner, Nick Castellanos, and JTR in there as well. I think it's a super difficult matchup for Michael Grove. And the Dodgers' bullpen has been very attackable all season. Uh, I think you can get to some Phillies here. I want nothing to do with Grove. Um, but once again, they're they're hard to to get to. Chorber's up to 5,600 now. Harper is 63. That's not cheap. Castellanos, 4,900. Trey at 56. JTR, 51. So to full stack them, like you got to really make some decisions. Um, so that's going to keep their ownership down and their value scores down. But I think it's a very playable tournament spot going after Michael Grove. I think he's super attackable here. Uh, okay, Ranger Suarez on the other on the other side at 5,300. I'm not dealing with this either. I've been short on Ranger Suarez for about two years now. Um, he throws mostly a sinker. He's moving a little bit of the usage over the four seamer this year, but the sinker is really not a very good pitch. It never really has been. He's always given up power and uh, a hard contact to the right side of the plate. It just hasn't totally translated into production. I think we're starting to finally see that for Ranger Suarez. With a two-seamer changeup combination, if the fastball mix is bad, I, I say this all the time, the changeup's going to be bad as well. Curveball is the only pitch so far in his five starts that's keeping him afloat, and he's still gotten picked apart in a few of his outings. So with just a 26% CSW so far, he's not generating anything, and an 18% strikeout rate, that's not a recipe for success against the Dodgers. So I think you could play them as well, but they're even more expensive than Philly. 62 for Mookie, 6,000 for Freeman now, 58 for Will Smith, and 55 for JD, who has been under 5,000 pretty much all season. Max Muncy at 5,000 also. In order to get to some of these guys, you're going to have to play a Chris Taylor at 3,000, Miggy Vargas at 32, Johnny DeLuca at 24, who they just called up. So... They're a playable stack, really both sides here. I don't want anything to do with pitching, but it's going to be super difficult because the Braves are also expensive. We'll get to them. San Diego, of course, at Coors Field getting Austin Gomber, super expensive as well. Um, it, that's going to leave the Dodgers and Philly kind of out in the cold here. It makes them a really, really good tournament stack, both of them. Uh, but it's pricing, and in order to get to some more expensive arms on the mound, it's going to be very hard to, to fit both of these teams in and be really happy with every one of your players. So um, that's the only thing that's going to prevent me from getting a lot. But, uh, you know, like I said, given the value scores here, specifically for the Dodgers, or given the pricing, rather, the value scores are still popping very hard. So I think this is a super sneaky spot for uh, both Philly and L.A. Okay, let's move on to Kansas City and Baltimore. Daniel Lynch on the mound. He was serviceable, I suppose, in his last start against the Rockies. He's at 6,800. Historically, Lynch has given up a lot of production to the right side of the plate, and he just kind of does that. Um, it takes him a while to settle into some of his starts sometimes, and that's if he settles in at all. Um, you know, in the start against the Rockies, gave, three or, gave up three or four in the first inning. Um and then you kind of settled in after that. He was serviceable, but uh, the strikeout stuff has really never been all that impressive, even though it is elevated so far this season. He's only got two starts. So um, I think you can go after him. I think it's a very sneaky spot for Baltimore as well. They're popping right there in value score with the Dodgers. However, they're a hell of a lot cheaper. They're missing Cedric Mullins still, but this is a, a lefty, and they usually hit him in like the nine hole anyway against the lefty. So... Um, I think they're going to go very right-handed heavy here tonight, and that's a bad, bad matchup for Daniel Lynch, who, as I mentioned, historically has given up a lot of hard contact, north of 35% to the righties, and a good bit of power as well with depressed strikeout rates. So um, I, I think we can get to some Baltimore here. I would really like to and play pretty much everybody. Austin Hayes, they'll, they might lead him off. They do some Ryan McKenna shenanigans sometimes, but he's the stone men as well, I believe, still. So that would be a playable piece. Um, and Austin Hayes in that 
scenario would be in the middle of the lineup. Uh, Rutch, you can play definitely. This is a, an upside spot, even though this is his downside, uh, hitting from the right side. He's at 5,200. He's a fine catcher piece still. Santander at 4,400. We like him a little bit more from the right side anyway. And Ryan Mountcastle at 4,500. Very playable price tag. Um, if you need to get to an outfield, a cheap outfield piece like a, a switch hitting Aaron Hicks, he'll probably be in there. He's been seeing the baseball a little bit better now that he's getting more regular at bats. Um, and really everybody down at the bottom of the lineup outside of Gunnar Henderson, they're all going to be right-handed and and see Daniel Lynch here pretty well. So uh, I think the Orioles are a very intriguing tournament stack also. And they're really, what, I mean, they're certainly in the top third of a value score so far and not so much in ownership. So that makes them very attractive. Tyler Wells on the mound. I think you can play correlated stacks, right? And I think the field probably agrees in that regard, at least playing a lot of Tyler Wells. Everything's been fantastic for Tyler Wells this season. Um, I think we've got a little bit of noise coming through, however. He's got an 085 whip. That's excellent, right? Really suppressing a lot of contact because he's using the full five-pitch mix here super equitably. Um, he is on the barrel here, however. He's always had problems with right-handed power and giving up a little bit of right hand, too much uh, right-handed contact, hard contact, that is. And that's still kind of sur- or resurfacing or hovering on the surface, I should say. Uh, this season, not so much an average, as I mentioned, but a little bit of the power is still there, 206 ISO and a 35% hard contact. So he's a fly ball pitcher. So when he gets on the barrel here, it does kind of go over, tend to go over the wall. Um, so I think that's that makes for some intriguing leverage stacks here, given Tyler Wells' ownership at 30, 35% or wherever he's going to come in. He'll be very popular, certainly in like single entry stuff. Um, he's really the only arm in this mid range that you're overly comfortable playing here tonight. So that's going to spike his ownership quite a bit as we get into lock. Uh, but everything fundamentally has been really, really good outside of this elevated barrel rate and really some noisy strand rate here. He's got an 86% strand rate overall. If you're giving up this many fly balls and this much hard contact, um, you're going to have some problems. And this strand rate, as we talked about with um, Garrett Cole, 86% is not sustainable over very large samples. Uh, it's, it's just not. And even the best pitchers of the last generation, DeGrom and Kershaw, they're only at 79%, as I mentioned before. So um, you will see regression in this number. He will put some people on base somehow. Uh, it's very unlikely to be via the walk. And he's got strikeout stuff, so it's going to keep his strand rate high, and he will still be able to suppress production with a low three ERs, ERA. Um, that you know, those are very damn, like real damn good numbers. Swing strike rate is great, chase rate is fine at thirty percent, and the CSW at twenty eight percent. That's very serviceable for a guy with a you know, this leading their rotation here with a full five pitch mix. Um, so I think he's very much playable. But if you want to play some leverage stacks of the Royals, I think that's okay. I don't particularly want to be playing a 5,700 Bobby Witt tonight. That's kind of out of, out of control. Um, buoyed by his monster game that he had, what, last week, I think. Salvi Perez at 54, he's fine as well. He'll make some hard contact, but I'm not super jacked about a 5,400 catcher piece tonight. I'd rather play Rutsch on the other side at 52. So if I had to choose, it, I probably... You know, price adjusted want to play the lefties, but that's really the downside of, um, you know, the hard contact platoon, if you will, uh, against Tyler Wells. Now, it's not like they're going to hit for zero power or anything. He's still at 200 ISO nearly to the left side of the plate. So he, with a bunch of fly balls still, it's a 29% hard contact rate to lefties. It's not nothing. They're still playable. So if you want to throw in a Nick Prado, Vinny Pascantino, guys that don't strike out, I'm really kind of attracted to here for the Royals. Uh, Salvi and Bobby Witt, not so much. So probably just like one-off pieces here for me, or maybe some short leverage stacks against very high ownership. Um, over here for Tyler Wells, because I think he is still capable of giving up a dinger here or there. But overall, um, I've just got to side with the, with the O's here, and... You know, you've only got to lay what eight and a half to five on them in the in the betting markets. I think that's an okay play here, going after Daniel Lynch tonight. Um, I think you could see some some offense really from both sides, mostly mostly from Baltimore.
Okay, let's move on to Minnesota and Toronto. Sonny Gray on the mound. He's been struggling a little bit. Uh, 9500 here. I think is a playable price tag and certainly very playable ownership. Um, this is a terrible matchup. Don't get me wrong. Strikeout matchup, that is. However, Sonny Gray's been elite, elite, elite against right-handers this season. 160 hitters, 203 average, great number, 246 Woba, elite number, 056 ISO with a 33% strikeout rate. The walk rate to the righties is slightly elevated, 9.5%, but like whatever, when you got a 33% K rate, I don't really care about that. He does have an elevated strand rate as well, north of 80%, once again, not sustainable. So if we're looking for some regression, that's probably where it's going to come. Slightly elevated walk rate this season in aggregate at 8.5% for Sonny. That's a bit higher than his historical averages. So um, regressing a little bit there in that respect. But overall, the numbers are are still pretty good, mostly against right-handers. However, he's getting... Uh, he's pitching to a lot of contact against the left side. 15% strikeout rate to lefties here. Not translating so much into power. It's just a buck 10 ISO, but a 266 average is, um, I mean, it's not bad figure, but it is definitely attackable here. So Toronto, unlucky for them, they've only got three lefties and they're missing probably Kevin Kiermaier tonight, who got hit last night, I believe. Uh, had to come out of the game. He'll probably get a day off. So who they are going to have is Brandon Belt and Dalton Varsho, who got a day off yesterday, I believe. Uh, maybe the day before, and like a Cab Biggio who kind of stinks. So it's just the three lefties in the list, and that makes Sonny Gray playable in terms of a a platoon split matchup uh, because he's been so, so good against the right side. However, the righties that they've got over here, Springer, Brichette, Vladdy, Matt Chapman, Whit Merrifield, even Ali Kirk, they, they are still contributing as well to this very low strikeout rate, super hard to get through a 21 percent k rate 115 aggregate wrc plus against righties for toronto this year 33 34 percent hard contact with a buck 70 iso these numbers starting to drift up a little bit as toronto is starting to score um so it makes it a hard matchup to be get to get super thrilled about attacking with sunny gray here at this particular price tag at 95 uh, i think it puts him in play mostly because of the really depressed ownership figure here and he has the upside to pick them apart because he's got very very good breaking stuff uh in particular the slider he spread out the fastball usage this season and he's got six pitches so i think this makes him very equitable and serviceable in plus matchups i think this is a down strikeout matchup of course uh, but it is a plus platoon matchup and that's what i think keeps him in play i'm really not jacked about the price tag uh, but I think that makes him serviceable and attractive in tournaments at 2-3% ownership, whatever it is. Uh, on the other side, Yusei Gakuchi at 7,100. I don't think I could play this tonight. He's just giving up too, too much production. He was good earlier in the season, right? But to both sides of the plate, I mean, he's only got 43 hitters to the lefties, you know, whatever. But to the right side of the plate, you got 220 hitters here, 280 average allowed, 372 Woba with a 250 ISO. Strikeout rate is about average, 23%, but the hard contact rate to both sides of the plate, 39.2% in aggregate. That is monster. It is way too high. There's soft contact rates, sub 14%, sub 10% even now to, to lefties here. Um, to both sides here, at 13% in aggregate, this is not a recipe for success, even against the hapless twins who are bad and missing probably their best raw power hitter in Byron Buxton, who is... Stop me if you've heard heard this before. Hurt again. 91 WRC plus, 27% aggregate K rate so far this season against lefties. However, they're going to have about eight righties in the line, per, perhaps even nine righties in the lineup because Gallo is out. They're likely to leave um, their other lefties like an Alex Kirilov or uh, Max Kepler kind of on the shelf tonight in and just go very right-handed heavy with uh, their Michael Taylors, the the Willie Castro, the Kyle Garlick type of guys, um, et cetera, et cetera. So I think this makes for a very intriguing kind of off the board. I say off the board. They're popping top five in value so far and not so much in ownership are the twins. So I think this makes for a, a very good stack here. I like Correa at 44. 
Really like Royce Lewis as well at 38. Kyle Farmer is very much playable. He'll be in the middle of the lineup at 2,900. Can't play all three of those guys because you've got some positional um, problems that you've got to sort of maneuver here with shortstop, third and short, third and short eligibility for Correa, Lewis, and Farmer respectively. But picking and choosing two of the three, I think, is is fine. Uh, Donnie Solano is still 2,200. They're likely to lead him off, even though he doesn't have a lot of power. He doesn't strike out. And he's got dual eligibility himself at first and third. And you can play Kyle Garlick, Ryan Jeffers, or Christian Vasquez behind the plate. Both of those guys are playable. Uh, would prefer probably a Jeffers, but I think a 2,300 Vasquez also very much in the mix. So you can play Willie Castro or Michael Taylor in the outfield I, as well. So... Um, either of them. So I think this makes for a, a really interesting and, and deep, very much playable Minnesota twin stack. They're super cheap and they're going to allow you to get to pretty much whoever you want. Um, secondary stack and expensive arms on the mound going after Kikuchi. This 250 ISO number with a 39% hard contact rate and a two and a half homers per nine with an 083 ground ball to fly ball to the righties. 12 and a half percent barrel rate. That's the highest number on the day. 88% strand rate for Kikuchi, highest number on the day. Uh, he's got a lot of regression coming, even though his ERA and his XFIP are nearly identical. Um, he's given up way too much production here to opposite-handed here. He's got a bad four-seamer. He's got a bad changeup. So effectively, he's a one-pitch pitcher, and a, a slider is not an out-pitch against opposite-handed hitters, typically. So uh, very much tackable here. I don't want anything to do with 10% ownership of Yusei Kikuchi here. Um, even though the Twins strike out a lot against left-handed pitching, I don't think the upside is really there for Kikuchi, and I'd much rather just get to the Twins. Okay, let's move on. Houston and Cleveland. Christian Javier on the mound for the Astros. 10,800, yikes. Um, this is an expensive tag for him. His strikeout numbers are also down from last year, about seven ticks, to be honest, and it's mostly to the left side of the plate. He used to have a, a good bit of whiff stuff against lefties as well, in addition to his very high strikeout rate against righties, naturally, with a four-seamer slider mix, um, those numbers are still fine. But the strikeout rate to the left side has dropped off a cliff here this season, sub-20%, down to 19 nearly. He's given up a little bit more pop, and that's because he doesn't have a changeup. He only throws it about 5% of the time to left-handers, and it doesn't give him any value. He doesn't really focus on creating a, a really good equitable out pitch against left-handers. So that translates to a lot more contact. Now, historically, given the four-seamer slider mix, he's been a very heavy fly ball pitcher, and that's persisting this season. He's historically given up a lot of hard contact and barrel contact to righties as well. He's been very attackable in previous years because of those two figures. He gives up a lot of power to right-handers, hard contact, and a lot of fly balls and barrels. So 12% barrel rate, that's the second highest barrel rate on the day. Also an 82% strand rate for Javier. So at a very elevated price tag, he's going to miss the cut for me today. I'd much rather play Garrett Cole, who I think has got far less regression coming to him. Um, we've got about a run, run and a half regression between the realized and the expected metrics coming for Javier as well. He's got an 099 whip. Yeah, sure, he's got strikeout stuff, but he's always had trouble throwing strike one he's got good chase which is excellent and it helps keep him out of trouble a little bit more and it really masks some of these underlying worrisome figures to be quite quite honest here 37 percent hard contact to a same handed hitter is not a good number so it makes it hard to stack against him because he's such a heavy fly ball pitcher um and we get cleveland here tonight they are dreadful even though they put up a 10 spot yesterday they were in a pretty good spot yesterday um not so much here today but they're gonna be able to make a, a lot of contact here at just a 19 percent strikeout rate with some power allowed to the lefties here uh, against javier so i think this makes cleveland a couple pieces maybe playable i don't want to go out of my way because cleveland it is a 13 game slate and that's going to be really hard for for them to get there, but Stephen Kwan's 3,800. Josie Ramirez hit three bombs last night. Don't really want to chase that, but he will hopefully start to see the baseball a little bit better as we get into the summer here. Josh Naylor still very cheap at 3,400. Would prefer him to Josh Bell. Andres Jimenez still at 36. Will Brennan hit a bomb last night at 24. You can play all of these guys 
I mean, Miles Straw even got on base somehow last night with a triple, I believe. So they're playable, they're cheap enough, and they're an, another one of these teams that can get you there. I generally don't like going after Javier in full stacks, um, and I certainly don't want to do that with Cleveland on a, on a 13-gamer, but I think their price tags are probably going to force my hand here a little bit here, and I'm going to end up having some. I don't like a high barrel rate. I don't like a low strike one rate. I don't like a very high strand rate, and I don't like hard contact. Uh, so that keeps me off of Javier here, certainly at this price tag. Um, now, that said, he does have a very high strikeout rate against righties still, and it's not like 19% is, not, is nothing. Uh, and Cleveland's still bad. They only have an 82 WRC plus against right-handed pitching this season. So this makes him, at sub-5% ownership, a an intriguing and viable tournament play. Um, deep tournament stuff, I think, only because it's still a hard strikeout matchup and a very patient team over here. So the strike one problems are very likely to surface for him. And I would have to side with Cleveland. Uh, but that doesn't mean he's totally out of play here. Logan Allen on the other side, 7,700. I really like this kid, man. Um, but I think it's a terrible matchup. Now, I, I think he's probably in play here at 7,700. He's got a really intriguing and unique arsenal here with the four-seamer cutter slider split. Um, not too many guys throw a really good split. He's one of them. It hasn't quite translated so far into value. Just eight starts and 45 and two-thirds here this season. Leaving it on the table here with a, a break-even slider, and that's really why the cutter is not all that great. Um, but he's still suppressing a good bit of contact and getting some rollover ground balls with this cutter, even though it's not providing a hell of a lot of raw value. It's not necessarily a swing and miss pitch, and that's where a lot of the swing and or a lot of the value in outs above average comes from with a cutter. Um, nevertheless, I think this is still a very hard matchup for a lefty just in general. The Astros only strike out at an 18% clip. That is an elite figure. This is the Astros of the last several seasons against lefties. 108 WRC+, plus. they create a little bit. 175 ISO with a 31% hard contact and fly balls. So I think it's a, a difficult matchup. However, an intriguing price tag and fine value score. I think he is in play because every other metric outside of a super high strand rate for him as well. Stop me if you've heard this before. 69% strike one, this keeps him out of a lot of trouble and doesn't force him into bad counts with the slider here. So um, with a very low walk rate, I think this makes him serviceable. However, he's got a slightly elevated barrel rate here and the hard contact to the opposite side. Um, they are missing their best hitter tonight in Jordan Alvarez, who will likely be out. But that means they're probably going to go what, eight strong from the right side of the plate here, which makes it a little bit difficult. Um, I think he's he's got 20, 22 in the tank here. He can go six innings and strike out seven or eight even if he's really got this split going. I think that's fine. Uh, so it puts him in play maybe like a short stack correlation play with Cleveland or something like that. I think that's a in play and a viable construction. Might try to force one or two of those in. Because I really like the chase rate. I really like the swinging strikes. And he's got a 28% CSW here. Um, overall, I'm worried mostly about the hard contact and the strand rate. Looking for a regression there. But overall, he's a, a very serviceable arm. And I think it puts him in play. It's a fine price tag. I'm not going to go out of my way to land on this. But very low ownership here so far, I think, uh, puts him in play. Okay, let's move on to Washington and Atlanta. JoJo Gray, I think it's probably time for him to get really, really blown apart. He's been downtrending his last five, six starts or so. Um, walk rate is starting to resurface again. It's mostly to the left side. He's been very good in that department to the righties, but he's got a 60% walk rate this year to left-handers, and that is not equitable at all. We've talked many times about him spreading out his four-seamer usage to the sinker and the cutter, uh, but he's still throwing this four-seamer way too much. It's not a very good pitch, and he has to focus more on a two-seamer to same-handed hitters and, and a cutter to opposite-handed hitters in order to suppress a lot of the production. He has succeeded so far this year, but he's still getting beat up and giving up power to same-handed hitters here with a 200 ISO, 17.5% K rate to the right side. He's generating ground balls. And that's mostly due to the slider and the curveball here with a buck seventy ground ball to fly ball to the right side. 
But the 32% hard contact and very low strikeout rate are going to leave it on the table a little bit there for him. Just a 56-57% strike one here for JoJo. Also a super high strand rate, 85%. It's not sustainable long term, especially with somebody that doesn't have elite strikeout stuff. So the walk rate and the low strikeout stuff to same-handed hitters, that's a really bad recipe here against Atlanta, and they're seeing the baseball still also, right? They came back in that game last night when they really shouldn't have, and this is a really, really good batted ball matchup. They're one of three teams today that are that are popping over a six implied run total so far. Um, so I think JoJo is probably going to struggle quite a bit. I don't want anything to do with a $6,900 price tag for him in this particular matchup. Um, so give me... As much Atlanta as I can get, they're more attainable than, like, the Dodgers, for example. Um, however, still expensive, right? You still have to pay for 65, pay 6500 for Acuna, 58 for Matt Olson, 48 for Austin Riley. I really like that price. Sean Murphy at 43, very playable there. The guys down at the bottom of the lineup, Eddie, Ozzy Albies, who, who hit the walk-off three-run bomb last night, Marcelo Zuna, uh, et cetera, et cetera, they're a little bit more playable so you can squeeze in some Atlanta really without too much issue, um, but you're going to want to play some Acuna. You're going to want to play some Matt Olson if you can make this happen. And squeezing in even a 4,800 Austin Riley is not super uh, super easy if you're playing those other two guys, right? So um, I want to get to Atlanta, and I want to get to as much as I can. They're probably uh, number two on the day, I think. Um, yeah, I mean, they're they're right up there. The, the top three teams popping over the six total are, are really just kind of, you know, pick and choose your favorite, whatever you want to do. Um, so if you can make this happen, yeah, go after it. They're going to be far less popular than San Diego, for example, who we'll get to in a bit. Uh, AJ smith in on the mound for the Braves, I like this a lot, as a matter of fact. Um, I think this kid's got a really, really live arm. Is just a three-pitch guy without a, an off-speed pitch. Um, now he did just come out of the bullpen and he may, he may have a little bit of a kind of a show me off speed pitch, um, that he might bring into his rotation. But for the most part, he's a three pitch guy with a four seamer slider curveball. He just came up for the Braves and made his first appearance, uh, last week, I believe. So he's getting his first go through the rotation here. And, uh, I like this. I think you can, you can play him. We're really just going to be concerned mostly with him being stretched out. Um, now, at 6500 it's a little bit elevated price tag-wise for somebody that you might only get four or five innings out of. Uh, five innings I'd be ecstatic with, I think. Um, four innings, yeah, maybe not so much. But I think this is a playable... Um, one of the few playable pieces down here in the, in the 6K range... This is a very attackable offense, not so much in strikeout rate, uh, but once again, he's got a very live arm here. He's got good velo, and he's got really good breaking stuff. So um, I think uh, going after some Washington here, very low upside offense, of course, 86 WRC plus, 19% strikeout rate. They're going to make contact, yeah, but they don't hit for any power. Buck 21 ISO and a lot of ground balls here. Highest ground ball rate for a split-adjusted team on the slate. So um, at a buck 50, 31% hard contact fine, whatever, but everything's on the ground. So I think this is very attackable for Smith over here. And if you want to play correlated Brave stacks, it's going to be a way to get different. Uh, but check on his anticipated pitch count. If we get some news like that later on today, that should um, it make the decision a, a little bit more uh, black and white for us. So that said, I, I, I want to get to him as of right now. We'll just have to, you know, I like the arsenal, and I like the velo, and um, I like the way he hides the baseball. It's a high upside arm for the Braves here, and this is an upside matchup in terms of suppression. So if we can get five, and who knows, maybe even north of that if he's really rolling out of him, uh, I think he could be very serviceable down here at super low ownership. So I like that a lot. Um, so Braves almost exclusively here. I don't want to play any of the Nationals. If you want to get to a super cheap piece like a Corey Dickerson, I think it's okay. Jamer at 4,000 in Atlanta. Eh, it's all right in a ballpark that'll play up lefty power a little bit. It's warm in Atlanta, of course. 
That's fine. Luis Garcia's had a really good season, kind of a breakout year. 3,900, fine as well if you want to go after a young arm. Not going to get a, really an argument from me, but I think I'd side with pretty much the Braves um, across the board here tonight. No JoJo for me. Okay, Oakland, Milwaukee. Uh, Luis Medina is probably going to... Uh, I, I do have him in here as the starter right now, but he's probably going to come in as a long reliever. Looks like they've got um, somebody slated. Sam Scholl, I believe, or Sam Mole. Uh, <laughs> not sure why I said Scholl. Uh, Sam Mole. Um, he's a lefty. He's probably only going to go about an inning or so, uh, and then it'll be Luis Medina coming in after him um, by most accounts. He's got a bad fastball. He's really only surviving so far with the changeup. But a bad slider, bad curveball so far in his six appearances, five starts this season for Oakland. He's got a 48.5% strike one rate, so the walk rate has been a big, big problem for him. It's to both sides. It's throwing strike one and getting ahead of hitters. That's why the strikeout rate is so low. It's incredibly difficult to come back from being behind literally every single hitter that, you, that, that you're facing uh, or 50% of them. So um, 22% CSW, no thank you. Now, he does have a 60% strand rate, but he's putting so many people on base with walks and with raw contact at north of 80%. Um, they, yeah, this number will come up, but Luis Medina is really a, a below average arm with a, a below average arsenal. Um, so it's not going to come up as drastically as something like an 88% strain rate for uh, Yuse Gakuchi is likely to come down. So um, it's a little bit harder to suppress contact than it is to, um, you know, keep people off base, right? So uh, that said, I, I want nothing to do with Really, any of the Oakland pitching staff, you can go after them with Milwaukee. They're one of the other teams, in addition to Atlanta and San Diego, that are popping north of six. And I can guarantee you that's the highest run total we've seen from Milwaukee all season. They're going to be very, very popular. Um, as of right now, they're third in ownership in aggregate. But this is going to come up, and in sh some of the shorter entry tournaments, you're going to see them pop really hard. Um, and it's perfectly warranted. They got Willie Adamas back. They did option Bryce Terang. Uh, who'd been really struggling, but they've got Luis Urias back as well, and they have called up, and they're giving a little bit of run to um, another middle infield piece, Andrew Monasterio, who's got a little bit of pop and some speed also. Joey Weimer's been fantastic recently, had hit two bombs in their last series, had a very, very big game um, two games ago, I believe. And Owen Miller's been great for the last month and a half. Willie Contreras been fine and very serviceable behind the plate all year. Really, the only right-handed bat that's been in the lineup every day that hasn't been great is Brian Anderson. Um, but it's not like he's been horrific. He's 3,500, and he's got dual eligibility. And he'll be in the five hole with a, a good bit of pop. So you can go after right with righties, with lefties, against Luis Medina um, and Sam Mull. And all of uh, Oakland's bullpen because Medina is likely only going to go about four, five innings anyway. So uh, you'll probably see three different arms, at least from Oakland, depending on how many runs they give up tonight. Uh, so I think it's very much playable and we're going to want to get to as much Milwaukee as we can here. It's a super attackable spot. 6,000 on the mound for Adrian Hauser. I don't think this is a playable spot for him. He's only got a 14% K rate now. He came up, he had what, 25, 27% K rate that has really just uh, been on the decline ever since then. Um, now he's been hurt. He's dealt with some injuries over the last couple of years, been in the minors, you know, working on all kinds of stuff, throwing a, a lot of junk here so far. Five pitches, four seamer, two seamer, uh, a four seamer slider curveball split. Um, so it should be an equitable arsenal for him in terms of swing and miss, but it really just isn't. 14% aggregate K rate is leaving a lot on the table here. Um, so I think you could play some Oakland. You want to play a very cheap Oakland team to get to some of these super expensive stacks. They're ta they're uh, popping fourth in, in value right now. I think this is a very playable team here. Estiri Ruiz, 3,400. I like this play a lot. He's going to steal bases. Ryan Noda, 26. Ramon Laureano, 26. Seth Brown, I love playing against every righty in baseball, 2,800. Jace Peterson, plenty of pop dual eligibility, 2,200 in the middle of the lineup. J.J. Bladé, Shea Langoliers, 
both 23 and 2,500 respectively. So, yeah, sign me up for some very, very cheap Oakland. This is one of the teams that can allow you to get to uh, two expensive guys on the mound, like a Shohei Otani and a Garrett Cole, for example. Um, they can make that happen. And if you want to play the other side of the game here, go after Adrian Hauser. Brewers are going to be... Uh, much more popular than Oakland, certainly. And it's certainly hard to get there with Oakland. Uh, but this is a hitter-friendly ballpark here in a very hitter-friendly matchup uh, for the A's. I think they can really put up a, a decent bit of production here and certainly pay off all of these price tags. They're way too cheap for the upside that they offer in this matchup. So no pitching here for me. Um, really offense only. And I like Oakland a pretty good, pretty good bit, in addition to, to the Brewers as well. Okay, let's move on to Miami and Chicago. Um, Yuri Perez on the mound, 8,900. No, thank you. I think he's too expensive. Uh, now, I, I really like the upside for this kid, but he's, what, 21 years old here. And um, I think we're going to see he's only got five starts in the bigs. I think we're going to start to see some regressions set in here a little bit. He's similar to a couple other of Miami's starters, um, like an Eddie Cabrera, for example with a bad fastball and really good secondary stuff so far. Um, now, the values are going to be a little bit noisy. He's going to have trouble with command and throwing it over the plate, but the upside is there for this kid. He's got a really, really big arm, a lot of velo, and a killer change velo delta at a full eight miles an hour here. This is a really, really good pitch, his changeup. I wish he'd throw it more. But that said, he's got an 88% strand rate himself. This is about the 12th time I've said this today. This number is not sustainable, especially for a very young arm like this. I think you can get to some off-the-board White Sox stacks here. Now, similar to a Byron Buxton, Eloy Jimenez got hurt again last night, so he's probably going to be out of the lineup. Um, they were really just starting to get healthy, but yeah, then they you know, lose their one of their better contact hitters in Eloy Jimenez. All of these guys are cheap as well and very attainable. I think this makes them an intriguing tournament stack. Tim Anderson, just 4300 This is a damn good price for him. The only guy you really got to pay for is Luis Robert. He's 4900 That's not super difficult to get to, given how cheap everybody else is. We'd like to play um, some lefties here as well, like a, a Gavin Sheets or Yoan Moncada. Yoan Moncada is 3600 That's a plus side of his platoon, and he is better from the left side anyway. So uh, I like that play a decent bit. And you've also got... Is Mighty Grandal at 3600 in there as well. Uh, much better price tag for him. So I think you can mix in some White Sox stacks here against Yuri Perez, counting on some strain rate regression here, some suppression regression, two and a half or two and a quarter ERA with expected metrics two runs higher. Um, walk rate is concerning at 11 percent, 58 percent strike one rate concerning there as well, 57 percent hard contact rate against right-handers. So give me the give me the lefties, sure, but give me the righties, too. I like Tim Anderson. I like Luis Robert, Andrew Vaughn, Jake Berger, whoever they throw in there tonight. I think all of these guys are playable. I think this makes for a really, really intriguing tournament stack. Dylan Cease on the mound. I'm just not going to be playing him, man. Like, I can't do it with this guy. I know the walk rate is only 10%, but it's 13% to right-handed to same-handed hitters. This is an egregious figure, and we don't really have time to go into why this happens. Uh, but just suffice to say that his mechanics to right-handers are dreadful. He is a little bit more up and down um, and upright, I should say, against lefties. So that keeps him far more in the strike zone, which means he pitches to more contact to lefties, which depresses the strikeout rate. So he doesn't really have a good off-speed pitch against lefties, and he's got bad mechanics with the which should be a wipeout slider for him against righties. He could have a 35 and even pushing 40% strikeout rate if he figured out this damn walk rate against the right side of the plate. So I can't do this. He's given up 47% hard contact to right-handers. There's no reason that this should be happening. He's fully broken in the mechanics. Um and I recognize that this is a decent price tag for him, and he's still got a 24, 25% aggregate strikeout rate. Um, but I can't do this. I, I just do not trust this guy. And look at these numbers for Miami. Earlier in the season, we were attacking them pretty much ad nauseum with every right-hander that we could. 
they were striking out at a 28 and 30 percent clip. This is all the way down to 22 and a half percent. This is below league average or above league average, right? 92 WRC plus against righties now, even though they don't hit for a lot of power. It's mostly because they got a guy hitting at the top of the lineup, hitting 400 still uh, 10 days into June in Luis Arise. Uh, Georgie Soler has come on recently. We want him, you know, certainly mostly against left-handers, but if Dylan Cease is going to give up this kind of hard contact rate to same-handed hitters, no thank you. I'm not dealing with this at all. Um, give me some a little bit of Luis Arise. I don't want to pay 5100 for the guy because he's not going to hit it out of the ballpark. But Georgie Soler is fine. Brian De La Cruz at 4300 He's got some power here. Even a Garrett Cooper, who doesn't historically show a lot of power, uh, 3,700, that's playable. I don't want to play him at sole first base, so not my favorite play there. But Jesus Sanchez, who they just got back at 3,300, that's playable also. Jonathan Davis down at the bottom of the lineup in a wraparound. Fine and playable piece. Um, I think off the board, well down the list, like I'd much rather just play Oakland instead, right, um, than the Marlins here against Dylan Cease. But I think Dylan Cease is fully broken mechanically. Um, and I'm going to keep fading the guy, and I'm going to keep taking shots against him. I do not trust him because he could very well walk five or six guys here and make it four and a third, and you're just dead in the water if you eat 9,200 and, and 12 to 15% ownership on the guy. So uh, no thank you for me. Um, some Sometimes this, this bites me. But uh, I'm just not dealing with it. I watched the guy pitch, and I think he's he's got some serious mechanical issues here. So uh, really just the White Sox offense, maybe a little bit of Miami as well. No pitching for me. Okay, let's move on to Cincinnati and St. Louis. Um, ben Lively, I think this is an intriguing price tag, to be honest. Now, this is a horrible matchup, right? Uh, but I think he, like, he's got a full six pitches here. Um, and I think this makes him very serviceable. He's not walking people. He's throwing... Full 60% strike one. That's fine. I'd like a little bit more chase out of him. And some more swinging strikes. Now, he could get away with this type of arsenal and this low chase rate, low swinging strike rate when he was over in the KBO. Um, but that's probably going to be a, a bit of a tall task over here in Major League Baseball against one of the more potent offenses in the league in St. Louis. That said, I think... 7000 is an intriguing price tag, and I'd probably rather play him than 7300 for Jordan Montgomery and 10x the ownership uh, on the other side because I like the price tag more and I like the ownership more. Uh, I think this six-pitch mix is navigable uh, through St. Louis. They're still, still just an average creation offense at 106 WRC Plus against righties this year. And eventually, even though we're expecting all of these numbers to continue to, to drift upward as we get into the summer here, the 175 ISO due to the 36% hard contact, you know, we have an 1800 PA sample on St. Louis so far against righties this year. And, you know, at some point, we just got to accept what the numbers are, right? So um, I think that puts Ben Lively in play here a little bit. Uh, I like the, the batted ball contact profile here. Um, not so much the fly balls against lefties, but I do like the very high ground ball rate at two to one ground ball to fly ball ratio against the right handers here. And of course their best hitters, the Cardinals are hitting from the right side in Goldschmidt and Arenado. Um, not so much a Wilson Contreras, but you know, he's hitting from the right side. So, um, he's still giving up a little bit of pop to the lefties, but not so much an average and, even though he's got a very high strain rate here himself at 87%, this is good, definitely going to come down. If you want to play some Cardinals against him, yeah, go ahead and, and count on regression here. This number is going to tank eventually. Um, you know, this is 10% higher than anything that could be sustainable for a guy that doesn't have overwhelming whiff stuff. Um, he's got a 24%, 25% aggregate strikeout rate, though, himself. So I think it's fine to play some Ben Lively here if you land on a couple of teams. I think it's a Really intriguing, like similar to Rich Hill. Not a lot of upside necessarily, but he's got 22 to 25 in the tank if he's really rolling with a full six-pitch mix here. Um, so I don't want to go out of my way to click this in, but uh, I do kind of like this price tag at 7,000 flat. Like I mentioned, I'd rather play him, I think, than Jordan Montgomery. The Reds tonight, like, they're going to go very right-handed heavy. They're probably going to have nine righties in the list against him, and he's always had 
hard contact and power suppression issues to the right side of the plate. 270 average allowed, 349 WOBA, and a 212 ISO to the righties with just a 21% strikeout rate. It's two ticks below average with a 38% hard contact rate, 23% line drives to the righties. He's very much attackable against right-handers, or with right-handers, rather. And he's getting 20% ownership here so far. Now, I do like the price tag on him, don't get me wrong. And I love the value score here with this very high projection so far. But I think this is a super sneaky spot for the Reds' offense. These numbers for them in aggregate are going to tick up. Yeah, they've struck out so far this year at a 24% clip. Um, and it's not like that number is going to come down necessarily, but the run creation is going to skyrocket now that they've got Matt McClain, Ellie De La Cruz hitting at the top of the lineup. These two kids are very high upside hit tools. And these numbers, while the strikeouts may still be there, they're not going to strike out a whole hell of a lot against Jordan Montgomery, right? Necessarily. So, um, the, the power numbers are going to drift up the hard contact and the, Commensurately, the WRC Plus is going to continue to tick up with all these guys at the top of the lineup. Uh, Johnny India has been much better recently. Spencer Steers having a very good season getting every day at bats. Tyler Stevenson finally hit a bomb a couple of days ago against Dodgers. Maybe some power returning for him as well. Warm in St. Louis tonight. I think I would, if I had to choose an offense to get to in this game, I think it would be the Reds. Uh, I think in tournaments at least, um, I think. They're a little I'm more comfortable going after what's historically a better arm in Jordan Montgomery than I am really with the Cardinals, even though I would be perfectly fine playing the Cardinals as well, going after some regression for Ben Lively as also. So um, I think it's a really, really intriguing tournament stack. I'm not sure how much I will get of Ben Lively, but I'm definitely going to have some of the Reds here tonight. I think going after getting some leverage on 20% ownership in here with Jordan Montgomery is warranted. Um, I might have a piece here or there of Montgomery, but um, I'm mostly siding with Cincinnati here. Okay, let's move on to Coors Field. Uh, you Darvish on the mound. Man, I love this price tag. Look at this here. 8000 for you Darvish? You kidding me? Like, this is a 10K, 10.5K arm, um, and we paid that for him several times this year. He's now 8000 at Coors Field. This is really tough, though. Um, like, he's having a little bit of trouble against right-handers, with pure whiff stuff this season, not so much against lefties, right? 29% K rate still there for them um, against lefties, against them rather. 23%, however, it's just league average against righties, 37% hard contact to the right side, 33% hard contact to the lefties. Now, he doesn't have enough ground balls, certainly against the right side. It's just a neutral ground ball to fly ball to really overcome that very low line drive rate at 12% against righties. So that's attractive, um, but he's still giving up a lot of pop here, and this game is a Coors Field. So he'll give up fly balls, and that's not a good recipe, even against a below-average offense in the Colorado Rockies against right-handers. Um, they're going to go a little bit more left-handed heavy here tonight with Blackman, Jerry Profar, Ryan McMahon, really been seeing the baseball, hitting it very, very well and very hard recently. Nolan Jones, Harold Castro... Uh, they got Mike Boustakis as well. Who knows what they're going to do. Um, but they're giving these young kids a lot of run. And finally, I think they're going to have Zeke Tovar up, maybe not at the top of the lineup, but out of the nine hole at least. And he's at a super playable 3,600 here. He's had a lot of doubles this season. He's got some sneaky pop. And he's really coming into his own. Now, this is a plus matchup for Darvish because this is Darvish. And this is the Rockies, right? They're still an underwhelming and poor creation offense themselves, even though they're not striking out nearly as much as they were in the past. Still just a buck fifty, sub 150 ISO, 33% hard. It's really the line drive rate that makes me intrigued here. They're going to make some hard contact against Darvish, the lefties and the righties, and they're going to be able to get the baseball on the line. So despite a very attractive price tag here for Darvish, I think I'm probably off uh i don't know um i i, I mean with a seven percent ownership here for darvish i think you have to have some and you have to have a little bit of leverage on the field if you don't have 10 percent darvish i think that's probably a mistake um given the upside that he does display he has 28 and 30 here in the tank even at coors field you know this is still you darvish let's not get to get carried away here 
and he's 8,000. So, uh, you know, I do like this, and I'm going to have some. Um, but I don't know. that I do like the Rockies here as well. I think it's a sneaky stack, and they're right in there with Baltimore and the Dodgers and, and the Mets and Cleveland, you know, St. Louis, right? All of these teams really in a similar range in terms of, of value score. So um, I think you could play really both sides there. Austin Gomber on the mound, don't think you can play this at all. Uh, I'm not touching this. Look at these hard contact numbers to both sides. 39.5% to lefties, whatever, that's a small sample, and 54 hitters, but 35.5% to righties and 200 hitters. That is not a small sample. So Average is coming to both of them, 333 to lefties, 294 to righties, 382 Woba to the right side, 239 ISO to the right side with an aggregate 15% strikeout rate to both sides. Um, No thank you. He's got a 22% chase rate. He's got a 7.5% swinging strike rate, a 10% walk rate, a 9% barrel rate. Like Let's just go after him. Um, Sometimes he can survive a little bit. Because he's got five, or, you know, four pitches, five. Yeah, if he throws in a, a two seamer um, or a little bit of a cutter, sometimes. I know it's not displayed in the sheet here, but he he does do it. Um, so he's got a little bit of suppression upside in him, and perhaps some regression coming to him. He's got a 7.0 ERA with a 5.11 xFIP. Yeah, 65 and a half percent strand rate. But still, high walk rate at Coors Field, low strikeout rate, way too much contact. No, thank you. Let's get to all of the Padres. They're the most popular team today, definitely. Um, we have to keep an eye on Xander Bogart, see if he's back. He's been dealing with a wrist. You could maybe fade that if you want because of the wrist. But you got to play Babe Sanchez behind the plate, I think, at 3,900, hitting a lot of fly balls and seeing the baseball a little bit. Uh, Manny Machado, 5,200, almost certainly the best third base play of the day. Fernando Tatis in the outfield at 6,400. He and Acuna, definitely. Um, if you could squeeze both of those guys into a lineup, I mean, more power to you. You might have to play like Oakland or something um, to make that happen. But uh, certainly one of the top outfield plays of the day as well. So get to everybody on San Diego if you can. Colorado's bullpen, they blew three games in this last series against uh, the Giants when they got swept. They were ahead in each one of these games, and the, and the bullpen chumped it for them. So um, they are finally starting to regress, as we've talked about a couple of times in the last few weeks. So get after um, everything about Colorado and um, and and play San Diego uh, as much as you can. And But I like the Rockies from the other side, too. You can go after a little bit of this Darvish, but you can play him. Um, this, is a, this price tag is probably going to you know, tilt me onto it a little bit. Okay, let's move on. Um, Luis Castillo and Shoei Otani pitching only for me here in this game here tonight. Um, even kind of getting leverage stacks against some, some guys that can be vulnerable a little bit. Shohei been struggling a little recently. Um, I don't want to go after him with Seattle though. Seattle is dreadful against right-handers. They strike out way too much and don't create. And the Angels against uh, against righties are an average creation offense themselves, 106 WRC plus, and they strike out at an average clip too. So um, I'm not super thrilled about it. If I had to choose, it'd be the Angels against Luis Castillo. Um, but they're going to go mostly right-handed heavy. I mean, they, they've got like a Mickey Moniak, Matt Theis, Jared Walsh. What, they got four lefties, including Shohei. But and that's really how you want to attack with a lefty and go after this vulnerable changeup from Luis Castillo. So if I had to choose, it'd be the Angels because they just got better hitters. You know, Trout's not a slouch against right-handers, and Anthony Rendon is at 3,300, and he didn't strike out a lot against righties either. So if I had to choose, it'd be the Angels. But I don't really want um, any offense here pretty much at all. It's mostly just pitching. I think both of these guys are fine and both are playable. We got some shenanigans going on in the Shohei metrics, though. Uh, this projection is low because we've got a, a spot or two here across the game industry that is projecting him as, still as just a hitter today. Same thing with the ownership. So um, these numbers are going to both be higher, and that is going to spike Otani's ownership. Um not just in the projected metric, but it, in the realized metric as well when we get into lock tonight. So um, he'll be well north of 30%, as he probably should be in this particular matchup. I think it's a good spot for him at 10-4 to get off the schneid a little bit. He's having trouble throwing strikes, though. Like, let's not get carried away. He's got a 10% walk rate this year. It's like, what are we doing, Shohei? you got to throw strikes. but um, So we're seeing a he's slumping a little bit uh, on the mound. If you want to fade that, play a Cal Raleigh. At 4,200 or something, um, play Julio at 51. I don't think this is horrific. I'm pr- they're probably gonna miss the cut for me because they're way way down the list in both 
value um, and and certainly in, in my projected ownership. So no thanks there. But uh, I think Jared Kelnick at 4,300, I think this is okay. If you want to play a Julio with a cheap Ty France or a cheap Cal Raleigh, cheap Tay Oscar, 3,200, I think that's okay and get off of like 35 and 40% ownership of Shohei. I don't think it's horrific. I'm probably not going to get there um, because I think it's a super low probability spot. But as we saw last night, low probability spots can still get there in baseball. It's very high variant sport. So uh, just offense or excuse me, just pitching only for me here. Um, it's just really price tags and ownership that you got to balance with these two guys. Uh, okay, let's get to the last game of the night, Cubs and the uh, Giants. I think both pitchers are in play here, as a matter of fact. Neither of these teams here in San Francisco are popping um, in in value really whatsoever. Now, not so much so for the pitchers on the other side in terms of their metrics, right? Just a 15-point median projection for Stroman here. Um, you know, 1.7 point per dollar and 24 value scores. Not all that impressive for a guy at 8,700. But this game is in San Francisco. It's going to be 55 degrees tonight, and he's a very high ground ball pitcher. So, yeah, sign him up. He's got a little bit of strikeout stuff. They're going to go left-handed heavy, which will probably keep me off of a lot of exposure to Stroman because he's only got a 19% K rate to the left side of the plate. But I really like the 3-to-1 ground ball to fly ball ratio and a buck 69 average allowed to the lefties. He's got an aggregate ISO here of what is this 087 086 um to both sides of the plate and those are fantastic numbers i don't care if they're going to go left-handed heavy or not um he's suppressed contact very well all season still in a high strand rate 80 percent but that's unlikely to regress a whole hell of a lot here in san francisco tonight so i think mark stroman's in play at 8700 and very low ownership at five percent i like the ownership number uh, a hell of a lot more than I like the price tag. Don't get me wrong there, but I think he's very much in play here. I'm um, staying still really far down in the strike zone with the sinker slider change combination, mixing in the four seamer and the cutter now, allowing him to navigate um, lefties a little bit better. So I think he's in play very much so, and that kind of takes me off the Giants outside of you know nice price tag plays. Um, I'm not super jacked about it. Yeah, you want to play Jock? I, I, like, okay. You want to play Lamont Wade? Ah, not really. That first base, 4,200? Uh, no thanks. So give me some Stroman. Uh, Di Sclafani for the Giants, 7,400. I think he's in play too. Uh, I'm worried about a floor and I'm worried about upside here. I think it's an intriguing spot for the Cubs, to be honest. Um, now, you know, we can't really take too much out of a 50-mile-an-hour wind blowing out, but... You know, that's not nothing, right, At, uh, at in San Francisco. You get the baseball up in the air, it can still fly a little bit. Um, he's not throwing it past anybody. He's always had problems with left-handers, with the sinker change-up mix. It's never been good. Slider's always re- been pretty good, and that's really persisting this season. 24% strikeout rate with a 146 ISO, sub-200 batting average allowed to righties, buck 75 ground ball to fly ball. Really attractive there. 35% hard contact. That's okay because he's getting so many ground balls to the right side. He's far more fly ball um, vulnerable to the lefties, however, with more hard contact. 36.5% to the left side. So I think you can get to some of these lefties here. Ian Happ, not super crazy about it, but I think it's fine. He's a playable 3,700, definitely. Mike Talkman, I kind of like this play here at 30, or excuse me, 2,500. In probably the five hole, I would say tonight, this ballpark plays up his skill set a little bit. Doesn't have a whole hell of a lot of um, ISO power, but he's got gap to gap power and he's got a lot of speed. So I think some doubles and a couple runs scored are very much within range for Talkman tonight. He's got a little little bit of pop too. Um, so it wouldn't be so overly surprising if he uh, he had a dinger in San Francisco tonight. But I like the price tag, price adjusted. At 2,500, I think there's upside there. Matt Mervis as well. He's 2,100. Got to play him at sole first base, and he's a young hitter. But this is a plus upside matchup for him against a vulnerable two-seamer change combination that Di Scalfani is going to throw. However, at 7,400, I think he's in play because he's in the same ballpark as Marcus Stroman, and it's 55 degrees, and he's 7,500. So if I had to choose, I'd probably still rather just play Ben Lively, I think, at 7,000. But I think... It'd go like Ben Lively, Disco, and then Jordan Montgomery or something like that. 
um, it, it, those low 7K guys. But uh, I think they're all in play. I do like the ownership figure here as well. And the projection, basically at the same number as Marcus Stroman, I'd much prefer to save 1300 and play Disco. Um, so I think he's in play because the, the Cubs are still going to go pretty right-handed heavy here tonight. They are very likely to have, I guess, just four uh, lefties in there with... Um, with Hap, Talkman, Mervis, and, and Miles down at the bottom. They might throw in a fifth with like a Tucker Barnhart, I suppose, as well. But uh, it puts Disco in play. Um, I think he's got six innings and, you know, a K an inning uh, upside in him. And that's very serviceable at 7,400. So mostly just pitching here. Maybe an intriguing off-the-board Cub stack a little bit, but I'm kind of just off the Giants um, and would prefer Strowman. But, yeah, not jacked about that price tag there. So... Uh, okay, that's it for the breakdown. Went kind of long once again here today, I think. Uh, so let's quickly go over stacks. Um, really no offense here for me. Outside, of that, I, I do like the Yankees. No, let me uh, correct that. I, I like the Yankees going after uh, Garrett Whitlock here. I um, think he's likely to struggle a little bit. If you want to play some hedge stacks or some leverage stacks against some Garrett Cole too, like Cole's just got average numbers anymore. I don't think that's bad. Um, exclusively Pittsburgh here today. I, like, I don't really want to go after. I'm lukewarm on the Mets. Um, they lost their best power hitter, and this ballpark suppresses a lot of right-handed power. So that's really Rich Hill's main vulnerability. i um, not super interested there. I like Pittsburgh, though, a pretty good bit. I think Tyler McGill can struggle here. Um, Pittsburgh, a, a really decent stack. Um, Dodgers-Philly, offense really only here for me. I think both of these pitchers are, pitchers are very much attackable on the mound. It's just price tags that you got to balance here with with the Dodgers and Philly. If you can make it happen, yeah, like go ahead. I'm I'm on board with it, and I'm gonna try and squeeze what I can in. Kansas City and Baltimore. Baltimore a lot. I like a, a good bit of Tyler Wells as well, and attacking Daniel Lynch with um, some Orioles. But you could play a leverage piece uh, here or there of some Orioles. Not super interested. Mostly just one-offs guys that don't strike out because Tyler Wells um, a really really strong play here. Minnesota and Toronto. I really like the Twins here tonight. I'm pretty much off of Toronto. I think Sonny Gray here is a very intriguing tournament play as well. He's expensive, so that's get probably going to keep most of my exposure down. But I want nothing to do with uh, Yusei Kikuchi. He gives up way too much pop to the righties. And Minnesota going to go very right-handed heavy here tonight. Um, correlated stacks with Minnesota. I think it's an intriguing deep tournament play. Houston, Cleveland. Um, I'm not really thrilled about playing Houston. And going after Logan Allen, I respect this arm a good bit, but I don't really want to play him either. It's a super difficult strikeout matchup. Um, you can play a cheap Jose Altuve one-off or something. He's 4,600. That's fine. Uh, but they did lose Jordan Alvarez last night. Christian Javier, I'm probably going to stay off of this. Makes him a really good tournament play at very low ownership because he has the upside to blast through Cleveland in that respect. But um, he's got a lot of underlying really worrisome metrics uh, that are – waiting to surface here. I think Cleveland and some short pieces there could be in play. Washington, Atlanta, Atlanta, definitely. Um, I don't really want any Washington tonight. Uh, Smith Schauber on the mound. I think you can play this in the low six Ks. Oakland and Milwaukee, offense only here for me. Um, good bit of Oakland I really like. And, of course, Milwaukee, if you can squeeze in and manage the ownership there, everybody is in play in, in that game offensively, I think. Miami and the White Sox, um, I, I think the White Sox are an off-the-board tournament stack here. I'm not doing it with Dylan Cease. The guy just irritates the hell out of me. Uh, Yuri Perez, I think he's probably due for a stinker here um, pretty soon. So I'm going to I'm gonna take shots and, and look for some negative regression and some positive regression offensively for the White Sox. Cincinnati, I, I like them a lot tonight. Uh, I think Ben Lively is in play as well, as is Jordan Montgomery. Pretty much all sides here, I think, uh, you could make an argument for. And it's an intriguing tournament game. San Diego, Colorado, I like offense definitely here, of course, in Coors Field. And you Darvish, he's 8,000. Like, he's 8,000. Okay. Um, I guess I just got to have some. So let's do it. Uh, but I do like the Rockies here a little bit as well. Seattle and, and the Angels, pitching only. Luis Castillo and Choi Otani. Maybe a leverage stack here or there, but, like, I don't want to really deal with that. Um, Cubs in San Francisco. Pitching mostly here as well. Maybe some Cubs going after vulnerable Disco. Uh, and some hard contact there, but like this game's in San Francisco. I don't really want to deal with this on a 13 gamer. So that's it. Uh, we went pretty long here, but once again, we got 13 games. Keep an eye out for projections updates. Um, we will have the Shohei Otani shenanigans fleshed out, as you see here, with a standard deviation of the projection and of the ownership, like super outsized figures here. Um, if you are regulars to the videos, you know that uh, 
a standard deviation north of five for a point projection is out of control high. So um, that should tell you that we got some some noise fleshed out. Though these numbers are also posted with the projections um, on the site. So keep an eye out for when those normalize a little bit, and you should know that uh, the Shohei numbers are adjusted. So that said, uh, good luck to everybody on this huge 13-game Friday.